It's been almost two decades since we started our journey to educate and help you take action so you may better manage your financial future. Our goal is to help you accomplish your life's purpose. This podcast reveals financial tips, strategies, and insights that will help you to set your financial goals and guide you along the way. This is Managing Your Financial Future, brought to you by the advisors at Lucia Capital Group. We manage your financial future as best we can. We talk about uh, things that are important to you. Johnny Dean, podcast host. Not an advisor, but uh, I am the moderator here. I just feel like I've learned a lot hanging out with you, Professor Plum. You're a certified financial planner, professional, I guess is what they call, CFP. And you've been doing this. What did we decide last week? 30 years on, on the uh, on the CFP side? Something like that? Uh, on the Yeah, I've had my CFP for either 30 or coming up on 31. I can't remember whether I got it 90 or 91. Right. And, and you've learned a lot over the decades. And I've been hanging out with you for, gosh, at least two-thirds of that time. <laughs> so, uh, hey, What is but, wrong with us? <laughs> I have no idea what's wrong with us. But but uh, if, at least for me, anyway, maybe you've learned some about the radio and TV biz. I learned a whole lot about the financial a- a side of this and buckets. We talked about buckets last week on this particular uh, program. And and so I, I would urge anybody who is uh, interested in their own personal finance, learning about things like this, you want to explore your own financial situation and, and, and learn something about that, I would urge you to continue to listen to this particular podcast as often as you can. I know we have a lot of people who subscribe and they download this and we appreciate that. Tell your friends about it. Tell your neighbors. Wake the kids. Phone the neighbors. Say, hey, look, this is a podcast you really got to hear. You got to understand uh, things about your money. Knowledge is power. I've said it many times. And, and I do believe that. I do believe that. Uh, it's, it, it really helps to know something. And if you know more than somebody else, uh, you're able to sort of separate the, 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 the wheat from the chaff or the goats from the gazelles, whatever you want to call it, um, <laughs> to, to uh, uh, I, I, I just know if you, if, if you know something going in, Professor Plum, when you talk to somebody, does it help to have them know a little bit about bucket strategies, a little bit about personal finance? Would you prefer to talk to somebody who knows something about that or not? It doesn't really matter. It depends on the person. Uh, there are some people that we talk to who know a lot about the wrong things, but think that they are smarter than anybody else. And they're not actually looking for advice. They're looking to tell us and or have us give them uh, confirmation know, a, an OK that what they're doing is right. Yeah. They don't want to hear that what they're doing is wrong. They want to hear that what they're doing is right. And it may or may not be right, uh, at least not from what we've experienced over the 30 plus years of doing this. Do you, uh, yeah. So, but a lot of people, we, we talk with some people who have no interest in any of this. Other people are like, how does this actually work? What kind of, they want to know the risks involved. They want to know what's going on a little bit. That's fine. Uh, it, but you know, like I said, some people uh, tend to think they know more than they do. Well, and one of the they're the harder ones to work with. Well, sure, but I, and I think either way, one of the one of the jobs of the financial advisors to make sure that their clients understand what's going on. Yes, you may have people who say just I just prefer to get a check every every month or whatever it is, and that's that's fine. But uh, but I know that when you talk to people, at least they understand something about why they're getting a check, how this works, how the taxes work, and all that. And it's important to understand at least some basics of all of this, and 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 that really keeps you from reading things online that may or may not be true. Now, one of the things that's sort of been in the industry for almost 30 years now, I was trying to figure out, it's been 26, 27 years since Bill Benjen, William Benjen, whatever, uh, did this study. And it was a pretty comprehensive study back in the early 1990s, 94, 1994 is when this came out. It talked about something called that they've now referred to as the 4% rule. Professor, right. you've said many times you like to refer to it as a 4% guideline. But explain it, it, what this guideline. is. Explain what this is and how this, just briefly, how this came about. Well, when Mr. Benjamin first did his studies way back in the early 90s, he was looking at how much could a person take from a portfolio on an annual basis and increase it by cost of living every year that the portfolio would last, at least have a dollar in it after 30 years. He figured people, if they retired at 65, wouldn't need very much money after 95. Some people are going to mess up with that and go live longer. Some people won't make it 30 years. So there's some wiggle room in this. But the idea was how if we have a balanced portfolio and he basically used 50% intermediate term bonds and 50% stocks, uh, I think he used an S and P, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, if we did that and rebalanced it to 50, 50 every year, we took out our 4% 
And then whether stocks went up or went down, bonds went up or went down, we reallocated at the end of the year back to 50, whatever was left, we made it 50, 50 again. He, found, he, he worked at, you know, 2%, 3%, 4%, all the way up 10% different. How much can I take out under historical, you know, rolling time periods? And he came up with about 4.2% was what he felt was a distribution rate that you could sustain from a 50-50 mix, rebalanced every year, increasing with inflation every year. You know, I think it was 92, 93% probability that it would last a full 30 years. Increasing now, on a yearly. Yeah. Giving yourself a CPI raise every year. Um, and so that became, you know, something of the gold standard. Uh, a lot of people have done some more research on it. They probably were doing it to try to discredit him, but they ended up you know, giving validity to what he was doing, saying that in this situation with this kind of a portfolio based on historical returns, it can work. Although today's world, we're in a little bit different, you know, setup where people that have been studying it, uh, some very smart, big names in the financial planning world, uh, Mr. Fowd uh, and others have said that the reality is with today's interest rates mm -hmm. and with, you know, what's going on with cash flow, dividends, you really should draw that 4.2 back down to about 2.4%. Ooh, now that's that that's cutting it almost in half. Now what we're talking about this sort of follows up on last week's discussion which was when we talked about the the high cost of income in a portfolio due to today's low interest rate environment. When they did this study, what you were saying back in 1994, uh, it had a 50%, I think, as you said, was it S&P or so, and 50% uh, bonds. When the 50% bond side is paying very little, you're, you're not going to be able to squeeze as much out of it, uh, theoretically. Is that what you're saying? Right, it's just not there. There's no cash flow coming from it. Yeah, so uh, the, that's the, why the bonds they, aren't do, the bonds aren't doing their part like they did back in the day. Right, they're not pulling <laughs> their they're not pulling their weight. In other words, and yeah. so you've 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 got to what they're saying now. Many people have been saying, and we, we've been hearing this, I think, for the last maybe six seven years. Not just it's not a fairly recent phenomenon uh, that four uh, percent. If you start taking four four point two percent out using that allocation. What they're saying is that it's too high. Is that correct? Right. And the way they were looking at it, they were projecting forward based on their expectation of returns in the market being less and their expectation of interest rates staying low. And they actually went lower than what they were talking about. Um, and so they're saying to be more conservative, to be conservative that we have that money 30 years from now, you may want to take less out. Well, that's hard to do. I mean, that, that comes back to what we talked about, the cost of money. So if I needed, you know, you know, t uh, you know, $12,000 a year from my portfolio, I, I needed to have about three, $300,000 in the past. Now I need almost $600,000 to have that same income. Well, that's, yeah. that's a tough one to deal with. I mean, that's a lot more to save over the time that you have. So how do you go about doing it? And then, uh, Mr. Benjamin was interviewed recently and they were saying, how do you feel about your, you know, your numbers, 4%. He goes, realistically, I think that by changing the portfolio slightly, instead of just using an S and P 500 for the 50% of the stocks, adding about 25% to of small cap stocks, we can create a portfolio. Let's go to four and a half by adding a more aggressive stance to the overall portfolio. You mean you mean would have been able to give you a four and a half percent distribution rate? Not right. you're would not have, talking about a rate of return here. Well, in, in essence, it is an ultimate overall rate of return because he's talking about ending the thirty years with at least a dollar in the portfolio, and so that's what we would have to. That's what you would have to assume it, it did over that period of time. The problem is when you have downturns, it takes away from your return very quickly. It's kind of like if you're on the freeway averaging sixty miles an hour. Yeah, to get your average up, you have to go really fast for a while. But if you drop off your speed for just a short period of time, it brings your average down real quick. Same thing happens in investing. You have a couple bad years, it brings your and you're taking money out of the portfolio. It brings your average down real quick. Uh, so it's just a matter of he thinks that by adding some small cap, some different types of stocks to the overall mix, you increase the distribution portfolio because it has an overall 
risk correlation and return correlation for what's happening. So now, in, make, instead make of no mistake, he's talking about selling assets every year to create that cash flow. He, I'm sorry, he is he is talking about that. He is he is because that's the only way to get it because the cash flow on those portfolios he was talking about we're not creating four percent in today's world anymore. So yeah. you have to you have to assume that you're going to be selling some assets on an ongoing basis. The cash flow versus distribution value. Now that's not something that you would normally uh, be a proponent of, Professor. Plum. I am only a proponent of doing that when the the market is in a positive nature from where you started. <laughs> <laughs> but you would. I want to avoid selling assets at a loss whenever possible. Well, well, we've and, seen the damage that can do what we call reverse dollar cost averaging, right? And if you're doing it automatically annually, you are once in a while going to be doing it in a bad time horizon. And so, how do we avoid? selling when the markets are down. And the markets can be down. Now, they haven't been down for long periods of time lately. Uh, last week, we talked about the 2018 downturn that was over with by mid-2019. And then we had the one early in 2020 that was over with by July of 2020. It was such a deep, sharp V. Uh, it was amazing. But at some point, we may get a downturn again, like historic you know, we've seen in this history, where the markets take a year or two to get to the bottom and then take three, four, five more years to get back where they just were at the beginning. And if that happens, selling assets is going to deplete your portfolio, to create the same cash flow is going to deplete your portfolio pretty dramatically. You just, you don't want to do that. Uh, and so we want to find a way to avoid it. And what we have done through our numbers, through our research and things of that nature is by blending the types, by man, matching the assets, the risk, the return, the time horizons, and I'll let the assets do what they're what they do best. That helps you create that portfolio where you don't have to sell when the market is down. What I mean, what do I mean by let assets do what they do best? Cash is meant to be spent over the next several years. I'm not talking about in, uh, in emergency fund or something just for the the rainy day, but if you have cash. It doesn't do you any good over a long period of time because it doesn't make any money, but it's a store of value for the short period of time. So let's spend cash and buy time with that cash to let stocks and other investments that can perform better than inflation, let them do what they do. Now, what they do, they go up and down. We just have to avoid the downtime. So we have to have a long enough time horizon to let it get to a positive time horizon. How long that is depends on how aggressive or conservative your feelings are. And so by creating this time segmentation, if you start it today and the markets go straight up, fine. You can always take your profits out of the market instead of the cash and refill the cash, however you want to do it. But if the markets go down, fine. You got cash you can live on while the markets go through their little temper tantrums and wait to come back up. Hmm. You know, this sounds an awful lot like a bucket strategy that we described uh, in, the, in, the previous, in the previous podcast. This is this is what we talk about managing, matching rather, your assets to your liabilities, as you said. And uh, we, we've written all kinds of things and done all kinds of podcasts. We've talked before about bucket strategies and why, uh, because the markets don't go up uh, 100% of the time. Now, we've heard uh, from the other folks who have said that uh, the just getting back very quickly to this 4% rule, whatever you want to call it, um, we've heard from people, you, you mentioned them earlier, who say, well, gosh, now 4.2 or 4% is too high. It should be uh, you know, closer to 2.2% in some cases. We've heard uh, Mr. Benjen, who came out in, in the article you referenced a little bit ago in an interview, where he said, if you do it a certain way, we can go up to 45 percent. What is your take on this, though, Professor Plum, as far as using a guideline like this? I don't think you're in the 2.2 percent category, but I want to get your feelings or at least express for the folks listening to this podcast what your thoughts are on this withdrawal rate uh, question. Well, when it comes to the 4 percent rule, as they call it, it, I like you can use it as an overall guideline and say, OK, if I have a million dollars, I can support 40, $45,000 a year of distributions from the portfolio. Where I disagree with the 4% rule is how they invest the money underneath of it to create and support that distribution. I would rather see a bucket strategy than a balanced approach because while the balanced approach can work 
it, with Murphy's law says you're not going to have that much of the time in your favor. And the next five years are going to be bad years and your portfolio and you'll have the longevity to uh, make it be a problem for you. And so I'd rather see that from a bucket strategy. And I think it's likely to achieve that 4% distribution from a bucket strategy than from that balanced portfolio. So it's, I kind of do go along with uh, Kitsis and Fowl uh, that I think the distribution would need to be less from a, a balanced portfolio. Although the last couple of years, portfolios have done very well. Uh, markets have done well, but um, I just like having a little bit more conservative nature to it. So I agree with using it as a, a barometer. I just don't agree with the way they invested it. Um, I agree with Kitsis and Fowl saying that if you're going to invest it that way, you would want to take less of a distribution. It all depends on your age, too, and your longevity. Um, I mean, I have a friend who's getting close to 60, and, and we've had many discussions. He said, there's no male in my family that's ever made it to 60. And so 80, 90 years old for me is not going to happen. He goes, I'm going to make it to 60, but you know, I, it's, I just don't have the family history, the hereditary issues to, to consider 30 years post-retirement. Other people, heck, their grandparents are, you know, they're doing just fine at 100 years old and their parents are out, you know. Parents are in their 80s. <laughs> they, they're they're going to make it. They're yeah. going to make it. Forget the 30 years. They're going to make 40 years post-retirement. So they have to be a little bit different on the way they manage their portfolios. Um, they just have to tailor it to who you are, your risk tolerance, your comfort, your, you know, how much you're spending. But you don't want to be taking 8, 10, 12% out well, unless now, you're 90 years old. When you're, when you're putting a bucket strategy together for someone and you're doing it, do you, do you keep in mind a four? For, so, for example, if you had somebody who says, look, I gotta, I've done very well. I got $2 million or so uh, in my portfolio. Just as a general rule, are you thinking, okay, they got $2 million. Uh, we can generally work around, try to attempt to get about $80,000 a year out of that, which would be roughly 4%. Do you think in terms of that, or does that not even play into your thought process? Actually, we do look at it that way. We start there, and then we look at what they're doing. Have they started their Social Security yet? If they're going to postpone their Social Security, we can increase that four percent because, by the you know, for the first several years, because once they start start their Social Security, then we can reduce it. Uh, but if we look at it and say, look, at I need one hundred twenty thousand a year, and I got two million bucks. Well, the two million can provide the eighty. Are they going to have forty thousand in Social and pension? Um, and if so, okay, now we're getting. We look at it as how reasonable are their goals. If they say, well, I got $2 million, I'm doing really well, but I need 200000 a year, and I'm still 10 years from Social Security because I'm only 56 or something, well, that's probably not going to cut it. Uh, and so without doing you know, serious math and doing other things, we, we can take a look at it and say, you know what? That's a 10% distribution. Uh, it's going to be a little tough. Let's, let's, you're not ready to retire today, at least not with that kind of an income. Uh, unless they also then say, oh, by the way, my house is going to be paid off in four years and my 200 is going to turn into 100,000. Okay, well, that's a different game. <laughs> right. Um, so but it's a great way to look at a portfolio very quickly. It's very easy to get a guideline of what your income yes. might look like yes. and, and go from there. Yes. And it's then get into the serious you know, actions after you find out that it's somewhat reasonable. Well, that's why I think you, you, you've you said over the years, it is a guideline. It's not a rule because rules are generally meant to be followed. Guidelines are meant to be used to, to guideline is something you look at and then sort of make determinations uh, from there. Uh, the, again, the example, what you just gave was if somebody's got 2 million bucks, but they need 120,000 a year, you might think, well, that's, that's pretty rich, but they say, Hey, but I'm 63. Um, in three years, I, I'm going to have my pension and I'm going to start taking my Social Security. And that's going to be more than enough. Uh, to, it's going to cover the extra 40 grand that I'm short. So can I take 120 for the first three years so that I can retire and get out of this lousy job or whatever it is I have? You might be more inclined to say yes. Is that right? Yeah. And they say, well, my Social Security and pension is going to be 50, 60 by the time I retire. So, yeah, that becomes in handy. If it's only going to be 40, then we've got an issue of we're short for the first four years and we're not making up the difference later on. But it all comes into play. The first thing is to let's see how reasonable their goals might be. For younger people, too, they say, okay, I'm saving the maximum into my 401k right now and my IRA and things. So I'm putting away 25 grand a year, whatever the number is. Uh, and so if I do this and I earn X amount, by the time I retire, 
I should have about X amount of dollars. And how much could that potentially support? Well, it could support, you know, your 80,000 or whatever the number is, plus your pensions and social if you have that. Okay, well, that I, that can work with that. So let's shoot for that. Keep doing it. It gives people incentive without having to go through serious, serious, you know, long-term projections of, you know, Excel spreadsheet, you know, everywhere going out, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. It, it's, it's a great way to do some, some, you know, napkin planning, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, you're on track. You don't have to have a 30-page financial document to say you're on track. You just have to have some reasonableness in what's going on. Well, it's about planning, it's about strategy, and it's about managing your financial future. And that's what we do here on this program. Once again, we try to at least give you some ideas of where you may want to consider doing a strategy. Where is your situation now? What are your goals down the line? How far are those goals? And what are you willing to do to perhaps achieve those? And that's what we talk about here on this particular program. I like that discussion, Professor Plum, because what you said was, that uh, the the four percent guideline, if I would say you don't agree with going down to two point two percent, I mean, if I have a million bucks and I can only get twenty two thousand dollars out of it, that seems a little low. <laughs> but as you said, it really goes down to the strategy, right? Right. If I'm going to use the approach that they're dealing with, I like taking a little bit less of a distribution. On the other hand, I think that the four percent is achievable using a different type of strategy than they're using by being a little bit more not creative, but looking at the world through a little bit different lens and doing things more appropriately. Yep, that's called the bucket strategy. And if you'd like some more information on this and how this works, uh, maybe an explanation of it. We have a couple of really good videos that you can go online at luciacap.com, L-U-C-I-A-C-A-P.com, or you can just give Professor Plum or any of the Lucia Capital Group advisors a call, 800-644-1150, 800-644-1150. That's the number there at Lucia Capital Group. My thanks to Professor Rick Plum. You are a professor. (laughs) Well, you're not really a professor. I am not. No. You don't even really play one on TV, but we call you that. Not anymore. Because, uh, not anymore, no. Always good to get your insight. My thanks to you for listening as well. Subscribe to the podcast and listen. Become one of our regular listeners right here. Managing your financial future for Professor Plum, I'm Johnny Dean. We'll talk to you again next time. The information provided should not be considered specific tax, legal, or investment advice and is not specific to any individual's personal circumstances. To the extent that this material concerns tax matters, it is not intended or written to be used and cannot be used by a taxpayer for the purpose of avoiding penalties that may be imposed by law. Each taxpayer should seek independent advice from a tax professional based on his or her individual circumstances. Different types of investments and or investment strategies involve varying levels of risk and there could be no assurance that any specific investment or investment strategy, including the investments purchased and or investment strategies devised by LCG, will either be suitable or profitable for a client's or prospective client's portfolio. Thus, investments may result in a loss of principal. Accordingly, no client or prospective client should assume that the presentation or any component thereof serves as the receipt of or a substitute for personalized advice from LCG or from any other investment professional. You should always seek counsel of the appropriate advisor prior to making any investment decision. All investments are subject to risk, including the loss of principal. This material was gathered from sources believed to be reliable. However, its accuracy cannot be guaranteed. These materials are provided for general information and educational purposes based upon publicly available information from sources believed to be reliable. We cannot assure the accuracy or completeness of these materials. The information in these materials may change at any time and without notice. It is important to keep in mind that investments in fixed income products are subject to liquidity or market risk, interest rate risk, bonds ordinarily decline in price when interest rates rise and rise in price when interest rates fall, financial or credit risk, inflation or purchasing power risk, and special tax liabilities. Interest may be subject to the alternative minimum tax. Treasury securities are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government but are subject to inflation risk. S&P 500 index is an unmanaged index and includes a representative sample of large cap U.S. companies in leading industries. An investment may not be made directly in an index. Investments in lesser known, small and medium capitalization companies may be more vulnerable than those in larger, more established organizations. Examples cited are hypothetical are for illustrative purposes only, are not guaranteed, and subject to potential federal and state law amendments. There is no guarantee that you will achieve the results discussed or illustrated. The information provided is based on current laws, which are subject to change at any time. Lucia Capital Group is not affiliated with or endorsed by the Social Security Administration or any government agency. Social Security rules can be complex. For more information about Social Security benefits, visit the SSA website at ssa.gov or call 800-772-1213 to speak with an SSA representative. IRA withdrawals will be taxed at ordinary income rates. Withdrawals prior to age 59 and a half may also be subject to a 10% penalty tax. Rick Plum is a registered representative with and securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and member FINRA SIPC. The investment professionals are affiliated with LPL Financial and are conducting business using the name Lucia Capital Group, a separate entity from LPL Financial.